my mic so I don't interrupt it. Cool. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, for this month's meeting of the Frederick County Civil War Roundtable. I'm Matt Borders, the president of the Roundtable. And this evening, we're going to be talking Florida in the Civil War. Our speakers this evening are coming to us from out of town. So that's why we're doing this as a Zoom program. And we are very pleased to have Lynn Herman and Julianne Herman joining us for this discussion. Now, this is going to be a recorded conversation and discussion. So if you miss anything, feel free to re-engage with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine's YouTube channel. At any later date, it's going to be up there for you to peruse. Again, thank you very much to the museum for having us, as always, and for being our technical support for this event. But we're going to turn it over to our speakers now. Lynn, Julianne, thank you very much again for being with us, and we're looking forward to the talk. All right. Well, my name is uh, Lynn Herman. I'm a former state representative here in State College, Pennsylvania. And I um, guess like most of you, became interested in the Civil War elementary school through high school, college, et cetera. But it really took off when I got on cassette tape, tape uh, Shelby Foote's trilogy of the Civil War, Fort Sumter to Perryville. And I'm sure many of you have this, uh, his uh, trilogy in your library. But I got this in cassette tape. So that when I would travel between uh, my hometown of Phillipsburg to the Harrisburg State Capitol, I could listen to it over and over and over again. So anyway, about 25 years ago, I got the doldrums living in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania, where it's cold, snowy, et cetera, in February, and said, I got to get out of here. Uh, what's the most southernmost battlefield I can go to? And it quickly came to mind that Shelby Foote talked a little bit about the Battle of Alusty in the Florida Panhandle. So I flew to Jacksonville and followed, <clears throat> followed the route of march of the Union Army from Jacksonville to Alusty and there, thereafter to Ta Tallahassee uh, all the time. <clears throat> Um, thinking about and studying what was going to be what I was going to be seeing. Uh, I did this on my own. I was the only one there. So the pictures you're going to see are my pictures, except for ones we got off the internet. Um, but uh, they're my pictures. They, of course, back 25, 30 years ago, it was film. So we transferred the film to digital. And uh, so I don't know if they come out of your screen or blurry, but they pretty, look pretty good on my screen. So <clears throat> anyway, I followed Interstate 10 from Jacksonville. Uh, to Tallahassee with a lusty in between. Uh, interstate 10 is actually one of the one of uh, three interstates that that uh, trans transcend from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, starting in Jacksonville, ending in Los Angeles. So, anyway, so I guess we'll start our program. Now, I want to point out in this map some of our major highlights. First of all, here is Jacksonville, which would become the base of the Union Army and uh, Navy uh, in 18, February of 1864. Here's Tallahassee, the state capital. And in between is will be the, will be Alusty, where the main battle will take place. Over here on the far left is Pensacola. Our battlefield was fought there. And then down here below, oops, is the Florida Keys. And I can't see. Anyway. Key West is off your map, unfortunately, way down here below where Fort Zachary Taylor is. And over here is Dry Tortugas National Park. So these are the, basically the four, four highlights of this map is Dry Tortugas National Park, Fort Zachary Taylor and Key West, Jacksonville, Tallahassee, Pensacola, and in between Jacksonville and Tallahassee will be the Battle of Fort Lusty fought in February of 1864. Now I want you to think about two things as I get this program and toward the end of the program. And that is this. The first is the Anaconda Plan that was developed by Win General Winfield Scott. How effective was this uh, Anaconda Plan, plan uh, to hasten the end of the Civil War, and specifically that around the, the Florida Peninsula? Number two, looking on the other side, the Confederates win the Battle of Alusty. How much was this Battle of Alusty, how much of an effect would it have to extend the Civil War for just a few more months. So keep those in mind as I start my program. So I went to Alusty, the park ranger gave me a personal guided tour. He said the annual battle reenactment had just taken place a week earlier. 
And of course, I also visited some Civil War sites in Georgia before returning home. And I'll talk about those at the end of the program. But the United States Navy did not have enough ships to effectively enforce the Anaconda Plan. Uh, uh, Red Butler, uh, if you remember the movie and the book, uh, Gone with the Wind, Red Butler was one of these blockade runners, and he became very, very wealthy uh, doing so. But the Navy, Navy also needed deep water ports, and all they had control of was Nor Norfolk in Northern Virginia and Fortress Monroe in Southern Virginia, none in North Carolina, South Carolina, or Georgia. Now, this is a picture of me along the bank of the St. Johns River in Jacksonville. The Union troops would have disembarked here. The only reason this picture is shown is that I met this guy who claimed he knew Penn State football coach Joe Paterno, one of my constituents. So, in many respects, Florida remains the forgotten state of the Confederacy. Although the third state to secede, Florida's small population ranking last among the Confederate states with some 140,000 people, 63,000 were slaves, meager industrial resources, and mostly isolated from the other states of the Confederacy made Florida of little strategic importance to either side. Indeed, one contemporary referred to the state as, quote, the smallest tadpole in the dirty pool of secession. Now, I said Florida was one of the least populated states back in 1861 to 65. How about today? Well, Florida is now the third largest state in the country with over 22 million people. And believe it or not, that the largest city is not Miami or Pensacola or Tampa or Tallahassee. The largest city today is still Jacksonville with over 950,000 people in its population. During oh the God. Battle of Gettysburg, Florida would only supply three regiments to the, to the Confederate Army. Uh, under Colonel David Lang, he was part of Richard Anderson's 2nd Division in A.P. Hill's 3rd Corps. As the war progressed, however, Florida did become valuable to the Confederacy as a source of much-needed beef, leather, and salt. Florida's cattle range provided tens of thousands of beeves to the South's main armies. The demand for Florida beef became even more critical in 1863, after the fall of Vicksburg, which cut off supplies from Texas and Arkansas. The peninsula's 13,000 mile coastline also provided invaluable for the production of salt. The Union Navy mounted numerous expeditions to destroy these salt works, but the industry continued. Now, Florida did provide some 15,000 troops for the Confederacy, organized into 12 infantry regiments, two cavalry regiments, a handful of artillery batteries, and a variety of smaller organizations. But like I said, they were at Gettysburg, which we are here in Pennsylvania. Uh, as an aside, this weekend, uh, November 19th, is the 160th anniversary of Lincoln's visit to Gettysburg and the famous Gettysburg Address. And Joy and I will be there for the festivities this weekend. Now, in January of 1861, Florida's secession convention took the state out of the Union they had joined only 15 years before. The final vote was 62 to 7. But there was more unionism existed in the state than this margin indicates. A large minority of Floridians harbored pro-union or anti-Confederate sentiments, a number that grew as the war progressed. But our story tonight begins with the outbreak of hostilities in Key West. And I'm going to point to the map here again, since my other map didn't quite show it well enough. Here is... Olusty, the red mark for the battlefield. Over here would be Jacksonville, Olusty, the Battle of Natural Bridge, Fort Pickens, um, and then Key West is down here at the end of the Florida Keys. This is a picture of Mallory Square in Key West, named after Florida native and Confederate Secretary of the Navy, Stephen R. Mallory. Any visit to Mallory Square will treat you to the most beautiful sunsets in the East. Now, a meeting was held on December 12, 1860 in Key West County for the purpose of nominating delegates to the state convention to assemble in Tallahassee on the third day of January, 1861, for the object of taking into consideration the dangers to this state and remaining in the Federal Union. It was the largest meeting ever held in Key West up to that time. Now, on December 11th, the day before this meeting was held, Captain John Milton Brannan, 
of the U.S. Artil First Artillery, who was stationed at the barracks at Key West, applied to the Adjutant General at Washington for instructions, where he should, quote, endeavor at all hazards to prevent Fort Zachary Taylor from being taken or allow the state authorities to have possession without any resistance on the part of his command. Now, when Florida seceded, Captain Brennan, on his own, on the night of the 13th of January, with orders to prevent the fort from falling in the Confederate hands, while the city slept, he marched his entire command of 44 men from Key West Barracks to Fort Zachary Taylor and took possession of it. He expected an attack would be made by the citizens of Key West on the fort, and Captain Brennan reported that he had, quote, four months' provisions and 70,000 gallons of water, but he that he could not stand a siege unless he was reinforced immediately. Now, construction of Fort Zachary Taylor began in 1845 as part of a mid-19th century plan to defend the southeast coast through a series of forts after the War of 1812, and of course was named in honor of President Zachary Taylor's death in 1850. The ordinance stores of Fort Taylor at this time consisted of 58-inch Columbiads, 10 24 flanking howitzers with caissons, and four 12 pounder filled howitzers, 4,530 projectiles, 35,459 pounds of powder, 22,826 cartridge bags, 962 priming tubes, and 750 cartridges for small arms. So it was heavily fortified and heavily ordnanced. On January 26, 1861, Captain Brand reported that there had been no demonstration made on the fort to that date, and that he then had no apprehension of an attack from the people of Key West. The sentiment of Key West was strongly Southern, but with the fortifications in possession of the federal troops and no military organization here sufficient to wrest this control from them, the secessionists were deterred from taking any active steps to capture them. The fort then became a key outpost to threaten blockade runners. Key West, the most strategic point within the Southern Confederacy, being in the hands of the federal government during the entire war and used as a naval base, was one of the determining factors and the result of the Civil War. Following succession and the outbreak of fighting, Florida's Confederate officials were immediately faced with the daunting task of organizing a new military force to defend the state. Now, the peninsula's long coastline, coupled with the fact that federal forces remained in the control of Key West and Fort Zachary Taylor, as well as Fort Jefferson, the Dry Tortugas, and Fort Pickens near Pensacola, made Florida particularly vulnerable. More importantly for the Union, possessions of these fortifications meant that they would have control and shut the flow of foodstuffs, such as sugarcane, coffee, and slaves from the Caribbean islands and South America to the Southern Confederate States. These forts also provided the Union with important supply stations for the ships on the blockade of Southern ports. And you can see from this map, again, the positions of Key West, down here, Fort Jefferson, the Dry Tortugas, Jacksonville, and Pensacola. The largest battle of Florida during the war took place on February 20th, 1864, in the Pine Barrens of North Central Florida near a railroad station named Olusty. The Battle of Olusty, which is also known as the Battle of Ocean Pond, followed the fourth and final Union occupation of Jacksonville, which had occurred on February 7th. Both political and military considerations played a role in the Northern Campaign. As the war progressed, and hopes for a Southern victory faded, many Floridians displayed a growing anti-war or pro-Union sentiment. President Lincoln's administration had received information claiming that many citizens in Northern Florida were Unionist. With his re-election coming up later in the year, the president, president evidently believed that if he could establish a loyal government in Florida, he might gain, glean much needed electoral votes there. Launched primarily to reinstitute a loyal state government under the terms of President Lincoln's Reconstruction Proclamation of 1863, the federal troops also hoped to interdict Confederate supply operations in the state, to open the port of Jacksonville for Northern commerce, and to greet troops for its Union's Black regiments. From the War Department, Major General Henry Halleck 
instructed Major General Quincy Adams Gilmore, who was commander of the Department of the South, a command of the Union Force along the South Carolina coast to dispatch troops from the Charleston, Charleston siege to Jacksonville and from there to establish a significant federal presence in Northern Florida. His orders from Pallet were, first, to procure an outlet for cotton, lumber, timber, turpentine, and the other products of the state. Second, to cut off the enemy supplies of beef and other commissary supplies. And third, to obtain recruits for my colored regiments. Now, Gilmore appointed Brigadier General Truman Seymour. This is the same commander who planned the disastrous Fort Wagner, South Carolina assault, featured by the movie Glory with the 54th United States Color Troops assault. To, he, he was made to lead the mission, and he brought both black and white regiments to Jacksonville. Now, six, now Seymour's 6,000-man force sailed up the St. John's River. They endured, disembarked in Jacksonville on February 7th and quickly gained control of the town. Over the next several days, Union forces advanced as far west as the outskirts of Lake City, some 55, 50 miles west from Jacksonville. Now, meanwhile, John Hay, President Lincoln's private sector, secretary, arrives in Florida to begin taking oaths of allegiance from Florida Unionists as occupation of East Florida seemed to be progressing according to plan. Gilmore arrived in Jacksonville just a few days later to confer with Seymour. Gilmore was apparently not impressed with the level of Union sympathy in the area and seemed ready to squash the entire expedition. On February 14th, Gilmore ordered that defensive works be constructed at, constructed at Jacksonville and nearby Baldwin and Barber's Plantation and that no advance be made without his consent. Now, Gilmore re re would return to Hilton Head, leaving Seymour and some 7,000 troops in Northeast Florida, believing that Seymour understood that he was not to move the men without further orders. Seymour had other ideas, however. Early in the morning of February 20th, unbeknownst to Gilmore, Seymour organized a 5,000-man force into three small brigades of infantry and one brigade of mounted troops with supporting artillery and then led them westward from Barber's Plantation toward Lake City. His goal is unclear. It's why we believe that he intended to capture the capital of Tallahassee, but this seems unlikely. He was probably just looking for any fight that might restore his damaged reputation after his poor performance at Fort Wagner. A few days after Gilmore's departure, Seymour informed his superior, superior that he intended to advance to the Suwannee River destroy the railroad bridge there. Quote, by the time you receive this, I shall be in motion, he wrote. Shocking Gilmore, who immediately dispatched an officer to stop Seymour. But the battle of the occurred before that officer reached Florida. Now, the federal the federals would advance in three columns along Lake City and Jacksonville Road, which ran roughly parallel to the Florida Atlantic and Gulf, and Gulf Central Railroad. The Federal Cavalry was in the vanguard, followed by the slower moving infantry. By midday, the Federals had reached Sanderson, where they briefly stopped for lunch. It was while at Sanderson that Seymour and staff were warned by a defiant Southern woman who said, you will come back faster than you go. The Union officers were amused at her boldness. Now in the early afternoon of February 20th, a few miles west of Sanderson, advanced elements of the Union Cavalry began skirmishing with a few Southern horsemen that appeared to their front. Southern resistance intensified as the Federals neared Alesti. Brigadier General Joseph Finnegan was head of the Confederate District of East Florida. Now Finnegan, well, he was a native of Ireland. He served in the pre-war U.S. Army as an enlisted man. He was a cotton merchant and was prominent in Florida politics and the railroad industry before secession. In the days since the February 11th skirmish at Lake City, General Flanagan had moved his force to Alusty Station, which is located about 10 miles east of Lake City. The days following the original Union landing, Finnegan had consolidated the fused troops still in Florida and had obtained additional manpower from Georgia and South Carolina, amassing 5,000 troops to equal that of the Federals. So ladies and gentlemen, this fight is a fair standoff fight with almost equal numbers of 5,000 Confederates 
against 5,000 Federals. Now, the Confederates found one of the few defensible locations in the area where a railroad passed through a narrow corridor of dry ground, dry ground bordered by impassable spots and bays to the south, a large body of water known as Ocean Pond to the north. So let's look at this map. Here is that uh, Florida Atlantic and Gulf Railroad. Okay. Here is the road that the Federals would march westward toward Tallahassee. Here is Ocean Pond. Here is a great bay here, which I don't remember the name of it. And these are swamps. So you can see the narrowness of the of battlefield here, which stretches probably about a mile to a mile and a half north to south, giving little ground for maneuverability. And we'll start talking here a little bit about how this battle proceeds. The Southerners had built strong earthworks and awaited the federal advance. When Finnegan learned of Danny's position, approach on February 20th, he ordered his cavalry forward to skirmish with the Federals and to lure them toward his main line. Unfortunately for Finnegan, the fighting east of his main line intensified, forcing him to send out additional troops to help those that were already deployed. A major engagement soon developed about two miles in front of the Confederate line. Now, both Seymour and Finnegan sent in troops piecemeal into this fight. Louis F. Emilio, a non-commissioned black officer in the 54th United States Colored Troops, Massachusetts, recalled that the battle took place in open pine woods, and he would quote, he would say this, without the shelter of earthworks with nearly equal numbers on each side, around 5,000, and thus it was a fair field fight. Now this picture here, I'm sure the trees were not the same trees that were back 150, 60 years ago at Lusty, but while I was on this battlefield with the park ranger and did this tour, I couldn't help but notice the small palmetto bushes that are in the light green in your foreground. Many, many of those. So this would definitely be the terrain, flat, and something looks something like this during this battle, with no trenches, no earthworks, just a straight, a straight stand-up fight. As the skirmishing intensifies, both Finnegan and Seymour fed additional troops into the battle. Finnegan advanced first to 64th Georgia and part of the 32nd Georgia, followed by the 6th, 19th, and 28th Georgia regiments and Gamble's Florida Artillery. Brigadier General Alfred Holt Colquitt, Colquitt commanded the detached units while Finnegan remained behind with the main body. General Seymour brought forward the 7th Connecticut, followed by the remainder of Hawley's Brigade in the 7th New Hampshire and the 8th United States Colored Troops. By mid-afternoon, the skirmishing had escalated into a major battle, which raged, raged for four hours. The battle threatened to turn rapidly into route for the Federals. Union infantry, excuse me, while Colonel Hawley was positioning the 7th New Hampshire, a wrong command was given and the unit fell into confusion. The 7th soon collapsed with some men running to the rear and others milling about in a totally disorganized mob. The collapse of the 7th New Hampshire directed Southern attention towards the 8th United States Colored Troops, which occupied the left of the Union line. The 8th was an untried unit, having been organized only several months before. Prior to Alusty, the regiment had seen no combat, and in fact, the men were not even completely trained. Colonel Charles Fribley tried to study his men, but he soon fell mortally wounded. The raw troops of the 8th held their ground for a time, suffering more than 300 casualties. Finally, however, they retreated in some confusion, leaving the Confederates in virtual command of the battlefield. With the dissolution of Hawley's brigade, General Colquitt ordered the Confederate forces then to advance. Since the beginning of the engagement, Finnegan had sent additional units, the 6th Florida Battalion, the 1st, 23rd, 27th, and the remainder of the 32nd Georgia regiments, and the Chatham Artillery as well to Colquitt's support. So by now, the Confederate lines stretch for about one mile north to south. Colonel Harrison commanded the Confederate left and Colquitt the right. To the Union side, to stop the Southern advance, General Seymour hastily ordered forward Colonel William Barton's brigade of the 47th, 48th, and 115th New York. The New Yorkers stopped the Confederate advance and battle lines stabilized for a time. The Union commander would later be, be criticized for acting slowly to an increasingly 
dangerous situation and for deploying his forces piecemeal into the battle. In fairness to Seymour, however, some have written, the battlefield's terrain somewhat limited his options. The Federal's lines were bordered by swamps on both flanks, so there was little room to maneuver, and the field itself was an open pine barren with little cover. The fighting during this middle period of the battle was particularly severe, with each side suffering heavy casualties. During the seesaw battle, the Confederates captured several U U Union artillery pieces and threatened to overwhelm the Federal infantry. Although the Yankees were under intense pressure, at a critical moment, the, the surging Confederates began running low on ammunition. Men searched the pockets and cartridge boxes of their wounded and dead comrades to obtain additional rounds. General Finnegan reached the battlefield about this time. With the arrival of reinforcements, the Confederates again began advancing. It was not long, it was not long before Colquitt's hardened veterans crumpled the Union lines, especially when the least experienced Union regiment's colonel was killed, causing his men to panic. Seymour hurried in reinforcements, including the United States Colored Troops, 54th Massachusetts, to stem the tide. By late afternoon, General Seymour had realized the battle was lost. To prevent a rout and to cover his retreat, he sent forward his last reserves. Colonel James Montgomery's brigade, which consisted of 35th United States Colored Troops and the 54th United States Colored Troops, Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. As the black troops advanced over, over retreating federal, as the black troops advanced, other retreating treaty, uh, federals would shout, we're badly whipped. You'll get killed. Seymour soon found the 51st Colonel Edward Hallowell exclaimed, quote, the day is lost. You must go in and save the Corps. When the black troops arrived at the front, their effective fire slowed the rebel advance, allowing the other Federals to withdraw. Montgomery's brigade stopped the Confederates for a brief time, enabling Seymour to begin withdrawing his other forces. One white veteran of the battle states, quote, the colored troops went in grandly and they fought like devils. By dusk, the Union forces had begun their long retreat back to Jacksonville. The 54th Massachusetts, the Federal Cavalry, and part of the 7th Connecticut covered the withdrawal. Many wounded and a large amount of equipment had to be abandoned in the hasty retreat. Fortunately for the United Federals, the Confederate pursuit was poorly conducted, enabling most of the Federals to escape. Still, it was a bloody rout. Quote, what we saw all made our blood run cold, one Union soldier recalled. Everywhere, men were staggering out of the forest, faces dripping with blood and sweat, dragging themselves and their wounded comrades to safety. That night, the Federals retreated all the way back to Barber's Plantation, where they had begun the day. By February 22nd, Seymour's battered army was back in Jacksonville. Now, the battle had raged for four hours, and the casualties of Leste were staggering compared to the numbers that fought there. Union casualties were 203 killed, 1,152 wounded, and 506 missing, a total of 1,861 casualties of approximately 5,500 troops involved. Confederate losses were much less. 93 killed, 847 wounded, and six missing, a total of 946 of approximately 5,400 troops, troops involved. Now, this would work out for the Union to be about 34% of the Federals and a little less than 18% for the Confederates. For the North, the casualty percentage was among the highest of the war, and Alessi ranks as the second bloodiest for the Union when comparing the casualties to the number of men engaged. Now, we repeat that. We think of Gaysburg. We think of Antietam. We think of Shiloh and all the great battles of the Civil War. But think this, ladies and gentlemen, for the North, the casualty percentage in this, this small battle of Alusty was among the highest of the war, and Alusty ranks as the second bloodiest for the Union when comparing the casualties to the number of the men engaged. Historians would fault the Union commander for failing to commit his forces to in concert, giving the Confederates a very much a strategic advantage. The Boston Journal reported a few days after the battle that the Union commander, General Truman A. Seymour, quote, went in search of a fight and got whipped. Now, a regrettable episode, ladies and gentlemen, in the afternoon of the battle was the apparent mistreatment 
of black soldiers by the Confederates. Contemporary sources, many from the Confederate side, indicate that a number of black soldiers were killed on the battlefield by roaming bands of Southern troops following the close of the fighting. Among the casualties was Corporal James H. Gooding, one of the first black recruits of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteers. Hometown newspaper readers had followed the war through letters Gooding had wrote home. He would write earlier, quote, we're off on another tramp. He reported to the readers of his hometown newspaper on February 8, 1864, but with no knowledge of our destination, he would write. A wide variety of letters and memoirs written by Confederate troops in the days and years after the battle suggest that as many as 50 wounded African American troops were shot and even clubbed to death by rebel soldiers. One would quote this I tell you, our men slayed the Negroes, a Virginia soldier wrote home. And if it had not been for the officers, there would not one of them been spared. A Georgia soldier recalled how the wounded blacks, quote, would beg and pray, but it did them no good. Some accounts shockingly described Confederate surgeons performing needless and purposely shoddy amputations on black limbs. The members of the 54th Massachusetts, that legendary regiment of black fe recruits featured in the Civil War film Glory, were among the first black recruits to enlist to fight for the Union. On July 18, 1863, the 54th Massachusetts led the unsuccessful assault on the Confederate positions at Battery Wagner outside Charleston, South Carolina. But their ranks had reached 510 when they were assigned to Florida in the weeks just before the Battle of Velusty. Early on February 20, 1864, they marched with a wagon train to Velusty, where it was fired upon by Confederates. The 54th marched into battle yelling, three cheers for Massachusetts and seven dollars a month. Seven dollars a month. If you remember the movie Glory, and it's absolutely true, white soldiers were paid 13 dollars a month and the black soldiers would be paid only seven. If you remember in the movie, they ripped up their first payment saying that this is not fair. We deserve the same amount. Well, their cheer pointed out that the Union paid white soldiers about twice that of the black soldiers. Congress had already raised their pay to equal white soldiers at $13 per month, but the 54th and the other United States Colored Troops would not learn this until after the Battle of Velasty. Union forces occupied Jacksonville for, for the rest of the war, but the 54th returned to siege operations at Charleston. After Lusty, the 54th fought in Charleston and Savannah and was mustered out in August of 1865. Now, if you go to Alusti, of course, every, every battlefield has a museum. And this is the 19th Georgia flag. The Alusti defeat ended Union efforts to organize a loyal federal government in time for the 1864 election. The federal was more successful in meeting the expedition's military objectives. Jacksonville remained in Union hands until the end of the war, open for trade with the North. The operation undoubtedly disrupted the supply of Florida cattle and other foodstuffs to the rest of the Confederacy, and the increased area of federal control made it easier for Florida Blacks to reach Union lines for freedom and for recruits to fill the ranks of Northern military units. All these objections, however, could have been met simply by the occupation of Jacksonville and without the nearly 1,900 casualties suffered at Alusti. Now, if you go to Alusti Battlefield Park, you'll see that 19th Georgia flag in their museum but you also will see this original 19th Confederate battle flag shown previously, and this United States flag, which is one of three United States flags to drape President Lincoln's coffin in the Capitol Rotunda. Note the difference in the stars. This is a different size stars with larger stars on the left on the top and the bottom than on the bottom. How this museum, this little known museum in Atlanta got such a eventful uh, Flag from the United from the North and the United States Capitol, I have no idea. So military operations continued in Northeast Florida throughout the remainder of the war. Union troops frequently raided out from Jacksonville to RAS Confederate supply operations. Anti-war sentiment would grow in Florida during the latter stages of the war. The state became a haven for Confederate deserters and draft evaders, and by late 1864. Confederate control over the state was effectively reduced to portions of northern and central Florida, and that is it. The last fight of consequence in Florida took place on March 6th, 
1865, when a naval armada landed 1,000 Federals on the coast south of Tallahassee. The Union troops commanded by Brigadier General John Newton were soundly defeated at the Battle of Natural Bridge. This Confederate victory assured that Florida would stay in Southern hands until the end of the Civil War. April 1865 began with the shocking news that Governor John Milton, ill and depressed over the deteriorating military and political situation in Florida, had committed suicide at his home near Mariana. Within weeks, Floridians learned of the surrender of Lee's and Johnson's armies. Brigadier General Edward McCook occupied Tallahassee. This was the last state capital east of Mississippi, still under Confederate control. He took command of it on May 10th. In a formal ceremony 10 days later, the Stars and Stripes rose over the Capitol building. By early June, the last organized resistance in southern half of the peninsula collapsed as well. And thus ends the Battle of Velocity in Florida in the Civil War. So, but that's not the end of my story. I could do my travels to Tallahassee. There's a picture of the state capitol. I took a tour of the uh, capitol of the House and Senate. I went to the governor's office to exchange my business card with the governor. And when I got there, the staff said, would you like to see the governor's office? I said, sure. And I got away in the office and they said, would you like to sit behind the governor's desk? I said, sure. He would never do that today. Well, it was Jeb Bush's desk. He was not there because he was in Washington, D.C. that day uh, for to attend his brother's George W. Bush, the president, the State of the Union address. So after Tallahassee, I rode, drove north into Georgia, and I was on my way to um, Anderson Prison, Andersonville Prison, where I saw a sign that said, Exit, President Carter's Boyhood Home. So I took a diversion to this, to this, uh, to Plains, Georgia. Well, when you say he grew up, uh, when President Carter had very, grew up in very humble beginnings, it's exactly just that. He grew up and lives in a nowhere town, a small population, and little significance. I then drove on, drove on to Andersonville, and this is a picture of the notorious Andersonville prison. In March of 1864, stories praising the conduct of the 54th United States Colored Troops, Massachusetts, at the, at the Battle of Lusty, again appeared in northern newspapers further pressuring Congress into equalizing the pay of black troops. Shortly after the battle, the Senate passed retroactive legislation to do just that and became law in June 1864. One soldier lamented before passage, quote, the fixed determination of the people of the United States to deny to the black the same equal rights and justice as enjoyed by the white. Nevertheless, African-American soldiers proudly continued to fight for, for these rights for the rest of the war and beyond. Sadly, Corporal James Henry Goody was not one of them. The soldiers' letters to the newspaper his home of New Bedford, Massachusetts, have been influential in the recruitment of 54th Massachusetts, pleading for blacks to enlist to prove the justice of African-American Americans' citizenship. Despite frustration with the government concerning the pay disparity, Two weeks before Alusty, Gooding was proud to report that the regiment was still, quote, behaving in the most exemplary manner and noted how refined the men were as they marched through Florida towns. Gooding was gloriously, grievously wounded and captured during the fight at Alusty. He was one of the first Union prisoners to arrive at the notorious Andersonville camp in Georgia, where he ultimately perished. Confederate and Union soldier accounts agreed that blacks received particularly harsh treatment at the facility. Gooding spent his last moments on earth in the hell of a Confederate prison, never knowing whether his country would ever give the men of his race the equality, equality that they had gloriously fought to obtain. Now, after Anderson, I continued to travel north to Irwinville, Georgia. Now, this is where President Jefferson Davis was captured on May 10, 1865, by a detachment of Union General. James H. Wilson's 4th Michigan Cavalry. When Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to General Grant, Davis's cabinet moved south, hoping to continue the struggle until better terms could be secured from the federal government. Now, as you, many of you know, a certain amount of controversy surrounds Davis's capture, as Jefferson was wearing his wife's black shawl when the Union troops cornered him. The Northern press ridiculed him as a coward allegedly that he had disguised himself as a woman, an ill-fated attempt to escape. 
However, Davis and especially his wife, Farina, maintained he was ill and that Farina had let him, lent him her shawl to keep his health up during their difficult, their difficult journey. And as you can see from this uh, photo, the Union Cavalry troops under James Wilson on the left and on the right, a, a, a political cartoon uh, disparaging uh, uh, Jefferson Davis as wearing a as dressed in women's clothing, being captured by Union soldiers, published and circulated among the North uh, in, in uh, great detail. Jefferson Davis would be in prison for two years at Fort Monroe, Virginia. Davis was indicted for treason, but he was never tried. The federal government feared that Davis would be able to prove to a jury that the Southern secession of 1862 or 1860 to 1861 was legal. Sadly, President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated at Ford's Theater on April 14, 1865. The assassinated conspirators were tried and went and convicted for four being hanged and others doing time at Fort Jefferson in the Dry Tortugas. Dry Tortugas is a Spanish shell word. Dry meaning that there's no portable or fresh clean water. And Tortugas is the Spanish word for turtles. So many years ago, I was vacationing in Key West and traveled by, it took, say, it took a two hour travel or a catamaran ride to Fort Jefferson National Historic Park. And there I saw Dr. Bud Sell and read the tour signs of the other conspirators in prison there. Now this is a picture of Dr. Mudd's house and his great granddaughter. The family still persists in his innocence and that's in Maryland. That's his great granddaughter there. They still say Dr. Mudd was innocent. In late December, 1824 and early January, 1825, about five years after Spain sold Florida to the United States for $5 million, United States Navy Commodore David Porter inspected the Dry Tortugas Islands. He was on the lookout for a site for a naval station that would help suppress piracy in the Caribbean. Unimpressed with what he saw, he notified the Secretary of the Navy that the Dry Tortugas was unfit for any kind of naval establishment. He reported they consist of small sand islands a little above the surface of the ocean. They have no fresh water, scarcely enough land to place a fortification, and in any case, all probably not solid enough to bear one. While Commodore Porter thought the Dry Tortugas was unfit, for a naval station, others in the United States government thought the islands were a good location for a lighthouse to guide ships around the area's reefs and small islands. Another naval officer admired the site and reported there was an out, outer and also an inner harbor. The former afforded a safe anchorage during all seasons and was large enough to, to let a large number of ships ride at anchor. Of more importance, the inner harbor can, combined a sufficient depth of water for ships of the line with a narrow entrance of not more than 120 yards. A small island called Bush Key was selected as the site for the lighthouse and construction of Fort Jefferson, named after the third president in December of 1846 under the supervision of Second Lieutenant Horatio Wright and plans drawn up by Lieutenant Montgomery C. Miggs. These should both be very, very uh, notable Civil War soldiers for all of you because it was Horatio Wright and General Philip Sheridan, who had cornered General Lee at Appomattox, and they are buried in Lee's front yard at Arlington House in Arlington Cemetery. If you walk out of Arlington Cemetery off the portico, General Philip H. Sheridan and General Horatio Wright's tombstones are the first ones right there in, front, in the Lee's former property. And Miggs, of course, was, was the quartermaster uh, during the Civil War for the Union Army, for the Union forces. Now, the design of Fort uh, Jefferson called for a two-tiered casemates and a six-sided outline with two curtain walls measuring 325 feet and the other four measuring 477 feet. Each tier of casemates contained 150 guns and another 150 were placed on top of the fort itself, which were used to support a large population in an area lacking fresh water and an innovative system of cisterns was built into the walls of the fort. 16 million bricks were used to build Fort Jefferson. Most of the bricks were made in the Pensacola area, a four-day journey by sailing schooner. But when Florida left the Union in 1861, bricks could no longer be obtained from those brickyards. Instead, they had to be shipped from as far away as Maine. At the onset of the Civil War, 62, 62 men of the 2nd U.S. Artillery Regiment, under the command of Lewis Golding Arnold, were moved to the fort 
preventing it from falling in the hands of rebel forces. Captain Meigs, Montgomery Meigs, that I showed you before, he took over as the superintending engineer in 1860 and worked feverishly to improve the security and defenses so that Fort Jefferson's heavy guns were first fired on January 26, 1861. The fort had a population of 168 people at the time, including women and children. In September 1861, the first prisoner soldiers appeared. Those sentenced by courts martial to confinement and hard labor for acts such as mutinous conduct. President Lincoln then substituted imprisonment on the tried Chutugas in lieu of execution for those who were found guilty of desertion. In November 1864, only 583 soldiers guarded 882 prisoners and eight were able to escape. On July 24th, 1865, four special civilian prisoners arrived. These were Samuel Mudd, Edmund Spangler, Samuel Arnold, and Michael O. Lachlan, who had been convicted of conspiracy in the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. Samuel Mudd attempted to stow away on steam transport when the 82nd United States Colored Troops relieved the 861st New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment on September 25th. He was captured. This led to his detention in the fort's dungeon, over which the words, Whoso entereth here leaveth, leaveth all hopes behind. This is a quote from Dante's Inferno. Now, Dr. Mudd would help the medical care during the yellow fever epidemic at the fort in 1861, which led to his, his uh, clemency uh, away from Fort Jefferson and to go home. But that epidemic killed many prisoners, including O'Loughlin and Joseph Sim Smith, the fifth, fifth artillery surgeon. If you go there today, a monument to Smith and his son is still present on the parade grounds as well as a plaque dedicated to Dr. Mudd's medical care. Mudd, Arnold, and Spangler are pardoned by President Andrew Johnson a few, just a few years later and released. Now, Fort Jefferson was built to protect one of the most strategic deep water anchorages in North America. By fortifying this spacious harbor, the United States maintained an important advance post for ships patrolling the Gulf of Mexico and the Straits of Florida. Nestled within the islands and shoals to make up the dry Tortugas, the harbor offered ships the chance to resupply, refit, or seek refuge from storms. And again, we'll go to this Florida map, and you can see the 1,300-mile coastline of Florida and how important it was to control this area, especially Fort Zachary Taylor in the Florida Keys and dry Tortugas National Park, and I control, control the Caribbean and also the Atlantic around Florida. The location of Tortugas, along one of the world's busiest shipping lanes, was its greatest military asset. Though passing ships could easily avoid the largest of Fort Jefferson guns, they could not avoid the warships that used its harbor. In enemy hands, the Tortugas would have threatened the heavy ship traffic that passed between the Gulf Coast, including New Orleans, Mobile, and Pensacola, and the eastern seaboard of the United States. It could also serve as a potential staging area or a springboard for enemy's forces. From here, they could launch an attack virtually anywhere along the Gulf Coast. Poised to protect this valuable harbor was one of the largest forts ever built. There were 30 years in the making. Those bricks from, from Pensacola and also Maine, from 1846 to 1875, Fort Jefferson was never finished nor fully armed, yet it was a vital link in a chain of coastal forts that stretched from Maine to California. Fort Jefferson, the most sophisticated of these, was never attacked. The fort fulfilled its intended role and helped to protect the peace and the prosperity of a young nation before, during, and after the Civil War. And that concludes my program. So I don't know, uh, Matt, how you want to handle questions. Um, Mike, have any questions popped up on the, on the YouTube channel or anything like that? Give me two seconds here to message him. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Uh, so I haven't seen any uh, questions, but there's been a lot of just people coming in, leaving emotes and leaving kind of a thing so far. 
Okay, great. Well, I'm glad to hear folks have enjoyed it. Um, again, thank you very much to the Hermans for their presentation this evening. Did you uh, have, Lynn, did you have anything to add before we Yes, uh, yes actually, off? I do. I have a question. A sort of a sure. trivia question. In my uh, introductory statements, I said I, I uh, had flown to Jacksonville and followed Interstate 10, which kind of follows the route of march for the Union Army uh, to the Battle of Velocity, et cetera. Interstate 10 is one of three interstates that travel that go from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific. From Jacksonville to Los Angeles. Name the other two. There's three. Name the other two. I'll give you 10 seconds. Name the other two interstates that go from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, the United States. I'll give you 10 seconds for all of our people to think about that, and I'll give you the answer. Do you want to take a stab at it, Matt? I'll take a stab at one of them. Is I-94 one of them? No. <laughs> I don't even know where State 94 is. Where is it? It's it's in the upper part of the country. I'm okay. I'm I'm a Midwesterner originally, and it runs okay. across uh it runs across the upper Midwest all the okay. out west. Take another guess. <laughs> take another um well Route 66 would be something I'd be thinking of, but I don't think it goes the whole length. No, doesn't. All right. Well, actually, one one of those is nine miles from where I'm sitting right now. Interstate 80. Oh, Interstate 80 <laughs> goes from New York City to uh, San Francisco. And the fourth, and you're right, one of those would be in the north, is Interstate 90. It goes from Boston to Seattle. Ah. All right. Now, I'll give you another, I'll give you another chance. Of those three, which is the longest? Mm. Longest knowledge. Of those three. I-10. I-80 or I-90? I've been on 80, and it's awful long, but that's this seems like a trick question to me. Is it I-10? <laughs> no, you you failed twice. It's I-90. <laughs> <laughs> Interstate 90 is the longest of those. Yep. yep. <laughs> longest interstate in the United States. So, all right. If there's nothing else, then um, I guess I'll zoom off, and thank you so much for letting me share my travel experiences. I'm sure just like you, I'm a president of our Civil War Roundtable here in State College. And like you, you're used to, used to hearing about getting the great lecturers, the great uh, battlefield guides, the people who write authors of books, the researchers. Well, Julian and I are none of those. We're travelers. And we go to these very far out places in the United States and go to these very far out uh, battlefields. And then we make programs out of those because hardly anybody ever gets to these, folks, these places. So I hope you enjoyed it. Well, we're certainly going to hear a little bit more about Florida. For Florida is one of, one, of the, one of the states that's hardly ever talked about in the great battles of the Civil War, and yet it plays a played a great significance both in in shortening the war for the you know, for the Union who controlled its harbors, and also the Battle of Lusty, who is one of the was what I say is one of the most highly percentage ca casualties of any of the great battles of the Civil War. Well, you did a great job presenting that information, Lynn, and we really appreciate you coming on. Um, again, everybody, we're going to be back in the National Museum of Civil War Medicine next month for our December meeting. We're going to have Pete Mealy from the Seminary Museum up there in Gettysburg talking about uh, the use of the seminary during the first day's fighting and what's going on around it. Should be a great talk. Remember, it is December, though, so it's going to be an earlier meeting than usual. It's not the third Thursday of the month. I believe it's the second. But keep an eye out for the newsletter and all that good stuff will be on there for you. But again, we hope everybody has a great rest of your night and we look forward to seeing you all in December. <laughs>